and it looks like we're live on Facebook right now. And so we welcome all of those who are tuning in on our uh, Facebook live feed to the worship here at First Christian Church of Seminole. I know we have some of our sunbirds uh, in Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, places like that who are watching because they've been contacting, making sure we were going to continue with the, the live broadcast. Also, uh, I, I'm hoping we have people in uh, Ohio, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, Idaho, and um, I'm forgetting one, North Carolina, Idaho, Tennessee, Ohio, because that's all my family. Uh, <laughs> So I'm, I'm hoping uh, that they're all tuning in as well. But we, we have folks tuning in from all over. We welcome you to be a part of our worship and the message here today. Uh, we're continuing our uh, series called Epic Grace and looking at some of the, uh, the epic fails in the Bible and how God's grace was even greater than the most epic of fails. And I love the story I came across this past week. Uh, it, it was around Father's Day, and one of the Sunday school teachers was asking her class of children, how do you know your daddy loves you? And the best response was from one little girl who said, I know my daddy loves me because when he reads me bedtime stories, he doesn't skip any pages. <laughs> All right? Well, we must have a father in heaven who loves us dearly, because when he records in Holy Scriptures the story of people's lives that are intended to inspire us toward uh, faith in Christ, God doesn't skip any pages either, okay? And uh, now that's especially true in the life of King David, who we're going to look at together this morning. David gets more space and more attention than anybody else in the Old Testament. And all of his wins and all of his losses are recorded for us, uh, which must have created, I think, a, a real stimulating uh, debate when David was nominated for the Faith Hall of Fame. OK, you're familiar with uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and the list of great people of faith. And David's name actually occurs in that chapter. Now, if you're a sports fan. You, you understand the metaphor that I'm using here because when somebody becomes eligible for a sports hall of fame, there, there usually is a committee that gathers together and one of the questions that's always raised is, does his character issues discredit his accomplishments on the field or on the court? Um, for example, Pete Rose, has more hits than any other baseball player in Major League history, yet he's not in the Hall of Fame because he bet on baseball. Barry Bonds has hit more home runs than anybody else in Major League Baseball history, but he's not in the Hall of Fame because of the suspicion that he might have used performance-enhancing drugs. So you have Hebrews chapter 11, this great Hall of Faith, uh, people that God is wanting us to consider as examples. And when you read through that list, you wonder, how did some of those guys get in there? I mean, we've been looking at some of these uh, epic failures who are the examples of epic faith for us. Last week, we talked about Jephthah. And today, we're going to talk about David. Next week, uh, Nick is going to wrestle with Samson. Another one of those guys mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, when you read his story back in the book of Judges, you go, how? How in the world did he make that list? Now, when David was eligible for the Hall of Faith, uh, that debate must have been really stimulating, uh, whether to put him in or not. I mean, how do you keep David out of the Hall of Faith? I mean, David defeated Goliath. David led Israel in military conquest one after another. David wrote psalms of worship that we still sing today. He gathered all the materials to build the temple. And yet, on the other hand, how do you put David in the hall when it was his own pride that caused the death of many people? 
in his kingdom or his failure to lead his own sons to a strong faith in the Lord. And what about the whole Bathsheba incident? So we want to continue this series on epic grace with the story of one of the most epic fails ever recorded in scripture. And I've got a difficult task this morning because I suspect <clears throat> that the last person who spoke the day of that debate about whether or not to put David in the hall of faith probably brought up this verse from 1 Samuel chapter 13 where Saul or excuse me Samuel is explaining to then King Saul why God is not going to let him be king of Israel any longer and Samuel says to Saul the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and you're going to hear that phrase many times in the Bible that David was a man after God's own heart and my difficult task this morning is to try to reconcile that assessment of David with the truth of what happened in the story that we're going to read today. So here's the context. Israel is engaged in battle against the Ammonites. David has led them. They, they are uh, experiencing a great victory. Now they have the capital city of the Ammonites surrounded and under siege. And David is no longer with his army. Now, don't make too much of that because it, it wasn't really the custom for the king to be there while the city was put under siege. Because that could last not only for months, but actually for years, perhaps, while they cut off all the, the water and the other supplies to those inhabitants within the city walls. So what the army would do is they would lay siege to a city, and when the supplies had all been exhausted and the city was about to fall, then they would send word for the king to come back, and he could be there to claim the victory over the enemy. And so David is back in Jerusalem. The army is surrounding the capital of the city of the Ammonites, waiting for the city to fall. David's back in Jerusalem, waiting for the word to come. And this is what we read in 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning in verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. And it's, I don't know, there's just something about the brevity of, of that summary of what actually happened that almost makes it more appalling. From the very beginning, David has one agenda, that is to sleep with a woman who is not his wife, someone who did not belong to him. And the fact that his motives were impure from the start are revealed in the revelation that this woman is the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now that probably doesn't mean much to you. But if you go back and read, there are in 2 Samuel, there's a list of all of these mighty men of valor uh, who fought for David. These inner, this inner circle of warriors, 30 of them are mentioned. And specifically in that list are included Eliam and Uriah the Hittite. This woman is the daughter and the wife of two of David's best friends who have spent their lives putting their lives in jeopardy and even now are out on the battlefield defending the honor of David. That's who this woman is. And he doesn't even give it a second thought. He just says, I want her. Go get her for me. By the way, it's significant that nowhere in the scripture does Bathsheba bear any blame at all for this sin. Now, she hasn't been so well treated throughout history in the art world, especially all over the world in art museums. There are 
pictures of Bathsheba from an artist's perspective. And most always, she is scantily clad and painted almost as a seductress trying to lure good King David into sin. No, she was the victim. In fact, later Nathan the prophet will describe Bathsheba as a little lamb. This is a story of another conquest of a powerful man who just assumed that he could have anything that he wanted. Bathsheba was helpless. There was nothing in that culture that she could do when the king sent men to get her. And if I sound passionate about this or maybe even a little angry, that's for a reason. I am. I mean, this is horrific. This is evil. And the problem is it's still happening in the world today, isn't it? And I'm tired of it. I don't know about you. I'm tired of living in a culture where one out of every three women today claim that they have been uh, have experienced some sort of sexual assault in their lifetime. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of the way we try to excuse and justify the objectification and commodification of women by saying, well, that's just boys being boys, or that's just locker room talk. And understand that this happens not just because men are wicked, but because sisters are wicked and protect those evil men and cover up for them. This event in scripture could not have happened without other people helping David. And listen, the same thing continues to happen today. It happens in Hollywood. It happens in politics. It happens in the workplace. And even more and more, we're hearing of it happening in churches, both Protestant and Catholic, where men in positions of power uh, who are protected by wicked sisters are dishonoring daughters of God. And it is sin, pure and simple. We need to call it what it is, call it out, and rebuke it as such. David did a wicked thing. He abused a daughter of God. And he sent her home after he got what he wanted from her. A short time later, though, he got news he never wanted. Verse 15 of 2 Samuel 11, the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now, here's King David, king of the people of God, the man who loves the law of God, the man who writes songs about how much he loves the law of God, and he instantly begins to plot how he can protect his image by violating more of the laws of God. The first thing he does is he calls Uriah back from the battle line under the pretense of wanting to know how the battle is progressing. And after hearing the report from Uriah, the king says, oh, that's wonderful, great news, Uriah. Thanks for sharing it with me. Now, before you go back to the battle tomorrow, go home and just be with your wife. Well, he learns the next day that Uriah does not go home. Instead, he sleeps outside the palace with the servants. And when asked why the next day, Uriah says to King David, how can I go home and be with my wife when the men, your men, the army and the ark of God, the God that I have come to know and worship is still out on the battlefield. And he says to David, you know, as long as you live, I would never do such a thing. David, I'm loyal to you. I am ruthlessly in pursuit of your honor. Now, you would think that response would have cut David to the core, that it would have just made him crumble in shame. But instead, his heart just gets harder. He says, well, Uriah, how about you don't go back to the battle today? How about stay here in the, in the city with me and have come in fact have, have dinner with me tonight. And David intentionally gets Uriah drunk thinking that maybe an inebriated man won't be as pious and uh, won't be so, uh, uh, will be a lot easier to, to manage. 
But Uriah, again, instead of going home drunk and being with his wife, sleeps with the servants outside the palace. Uriah is a better man drunk than his own king is sober. And it just gets darker. So the next morning he learns he didn't go home to be with his wife. And so David in the morning writes a letter to Joab, his battlefield commander. And he sends it back to the front line with Uriah. And in the note, David wrote, I want you to put Joab out, or excuse me, I want you to put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest. Then once he's out there and the battle is raging, have everybody draw back from him so that he is struck down and dies. This is the guy who is in the hall of faith, okay? He gives this letter, which is essentially a death warrant to Uriah, his own death warrant to carry to the front line because David knows Uriah has such integrity, he's not going to open that letter and read it himself. Once Joab receives the message, he knows instantly something is up because the last thing you would do once you successfully have surrounded a city and it is under siege, the last thing you would do is get close enough to the city where the archers could uh, inflict damage upon your own army. But that's exactly what he does. And not just Uriah, but other innocent men get killed in that action. Joab sends a message to let David know. And he says to the messenger, now be sure when the king gets angry that I let men get so close that they were struck down by the archers. Let them know, let him know that Uriah's name was on the casualty list. David sends a message back to Joab that says basically, well, you win some, you lose some. Just keep fighting. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 26, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. Of course she did. He was a good man. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife, and bore him a son. And you know what? Just stop right there for a moment. I'll bet the people praised David. What a humane and kind thing to do. That the king would show so much compassion for the widow of a fallen warrior. To take her into his own home and make her his wife. Those who didn't know the story would never uh, suspect. But those who did know the details, David hoped, would never talk. But David was wrong. Someone did know and had a lot to say because look at the last part of that verse. But the thing David did had displeased the Lord. Now all throughout chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, David is the one who appears to be in control. And he does a lot of sending. He sends to find out who the woman is. And then he sends some to get the woman for him. And then when he's done using her, he sends her home. Then he sends for her husband to come home from the battlefield. He sends him home to be with his wife. That doesn't work, so he sends him back to the battlefield with orders sent to his commander on what to do. And then sends for the woman once again. But look at how the very first verse of the next chapter reads. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. But now the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan came to David, the, the prophet, uh, confidant of the king, and says, Now, king, I've got, a, I've got a counseling issue. Maybe you can give me some advice. All right, King, you've got these two guys in your kingdom. One is very poor and the other is very rich. Now, the rich man, he's got flocks and herds, cattle, sheep, and whatever, uh, almost too many to number. The poor man hasn't got anything except one little lamb. And, and it's not really uh, so much a, a, an animal to him as, as it is a pet. It's almost a part of the family. I mean, it, it just eats from the table. It, it sleeps in his arms. 
And a traveler came through town, and the rich man didn't want to kill any of his livestock, so he took the man's poor man's lamb and killed it. And upon hearing that, David just exploded from the throne and said, a man like that should die. And he must pay back four times the amount of what he took. And then Nathan said to David, David, you're the man. Now you've all heard those sports shows where somebody shouts out excitedly, you the man, you know? <laughs> has an entirely different meaning to it and feel to it when Nathan says to David, you're the man. Look at verse 7 of 2 Samuel 12. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. This is Nathan speaking to David. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. I want you to notice how personally God took David's sin. Now, God acknowledged, look, you did wrong to that woman, and then you did wrong to that man, her husband. But most of all, David, this is personal because you despised me. You say, well, how did David despise God? Well, just think about it. He broke the 10th commandment by coveting his neighbor's wife. He broke the ninth commandment by lying. He broke the eighth commandment by stealing. He broke the seventh commandment by committing adultery. He broke the sixth commandment by committing murder. But most of all, he broke the first commandment by putting his own pursuit of his own desires above God's. He knew what God wanted, and he knew what he wanted, and he said, I'm going to have what I want. Maybe the only thing more epic than his fail is Nathan's uh, bluntness with David. You are the man. Now listen, David has dodged a lot of spears in his life, okay? Literally speaking, if you know the story. But he cannot dodge this one. And then here's the verse, this next verse that I think disturbs me more than any other that we've read so far in this horrible, horrible story. This is the verse that makes me wrestle with David's whole story more than any other. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin." You are not going to die. What? I mean, David lies, he steals, he covets, he murders, he commits adultery, and then he just says, oh, my bad. I, I sinned against the Lord. And God says, okay. Seriously? I mean, God's response is almost as disturbing as David's rebellion. Now, now, it's true that Nathan does uh, announce some severe consequences. The child that Bathsheba conceives with David uh, illegitimately will die. And there will be a rebellion in David's own house. And his own sons will act out in ways that remind us of his father's failings. But the reality is God took his sin away. And not just that but that God continues to use David, even after his epic fail. He continues to show favor to David. He continues to speak well of David's heart. God will even tell the sons after David, why don't you have a heart like your own father? Even in the New Testament, David's heart is extolled. 
And I'm frustrated with that. I, I'm even a bit angry by that. I want God to be as mad at David as I am. Then I realize, I think the truth of the matter is I'm more offended by God's grace than I am by David's sin. Why wouldn't God allow this epic fail be the one thing we remember more than anything else about David? But grace won't have it. God's grace is so shocking and so scandalous. It's so unfair. And that makes me realize that maybe there's more Pharisee in me than I like to acknowledge or admit. I, I think sometimes I have to be honest and admit that I'm more like that guy in Luke 18 that Jesus talks about who goes into the temple to pray. I'm more like him than I want to admit. You know, this guy who, who went to the temple to pray, he told God what a great guy he was, you know. Uh, praying to God, reminding God of how often he prayed and fasted and how much he tithed. And standing over in the corner, also praying in the temple that day, was a tax collector. And his whole prayer was simply beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the guy that God justified. God is so shockingly merciful to people who beg. And David did beg. One of the songs that David wrote, we call it Psalm 51. In the inscription that precedes the psalm, it says that this psalm was penned by David after the prophet Nathan came to see him. It goes like this. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out my sin, the sin of my, the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me. And I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins, but remove the stain of my guilt. David is a man begging for mercy that he did not deserve. And I got to admit, I wrestle with the grace of God sometimes. Now, let me go old school with you. Uh, I'm just looking around. I, I think everybody in this room today is probably going to get this. Now, second service, and, and when we have some people under 30, they're not going to be able to picture what I'm about to talk about. But you will get it, okay? You remember, uh, I was in high school when I took my first typing class. Okay? How many of you took a typing class at some point in your education? Okay. Okay. A uh, room full of typewriters, you know, those archaic machines where you, you had the layout of, of all the keys and you would punch a, punch a key and that metal arm would swing up that had one letter on it, swing up, hit a ribbon, either the black or red, as you uh, indicated, and it would make an impression on that white paper, all right? And uh, you had to become proficient in doing that. The problem is... You know, none of us are perfect typists, especially when you're just beginning. And so you would be typing along and you would misspell a word. Uh, maybe one letter, maybe the whole word, you know. So what do you do? Well, you remember we had that wonderful thing called whiteout or liquid paper. That was always right there beside your typewriter. Because when you made a mistake, all you had to do was flip that, roll that paper up a little bit, take out that little brush, and brush over either that one letter or that whole word, realign your paper, and type it over and, and, and put in the correct spelling. And you were golden. Then you could pull your paper out when you were done, and everything would be correctly spelled. However, if you held that paper up to a light, what could you see? All those white scabs. And you would know, yeah, that was a fail. That was a, that was, that was, all those fails. 
that were on that one sheet of paper. Now, people under 30 will never truly be able to grasp the, the wonder of that metaphor. Today, they sit in front of a keyboard, same key layout, but there's no metal arm, there's no ink ribbon, and in fact, they, they type on a, not a piece of paper, but a screen. And if they make a mistake in a word, they just hit the delete button, and that letter or that word is gone. And there's no record that it was even there to begin with. Now, from an earthly perspective, when we fail, we make mistakes, we may never be able to erase all of the consequences and memories of that fail. They'll always be there for us to remember. However, from a heavenly perspective, we make mistakes and God doesn't get out the whiteout. He just hits the delete button and it's gone. It's erased. It's like it was never there. This is, this is the stunning, scandalous part of God's grace. And I'm not implying that if we just say, oh, I'm sorry, that all the consequences of our fail will just go away. Fails can have collateral damage. But I am saying that when we beg God for mercy, we escape alienation from him. We, we escape the burden of paralyzing guilt that can haunt us. And, and we are no longer remembered the rest of our life for our most epic fail. Even when we've done our worst, God continues to send his best. God sends grace. And you know what grace does? Grace sends help to the broken hearted. See, we do a lot of things that can take us out of God's will like David did, but we can't do anything that will ever take us so far that God's grace cannot reach us. You cannot go where, where God will not hear a prayer for mercy. David even said it in his own song, Psalm 51, verse 17. You will not reject a repentant and broken heart, O God. And he won't. God will never turn his ear from a broken heart begging for mercy. And one sign, by the way, of our brokenness is our desire for holiness. See, David doesn't just ask God to pardon him. He asks God to purify him. Look again in verse 10 of Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. He's not just asking for forgiveness. He's asking for transformation. God, give me the kind of heart that, that won't be this kind of man anymore. And I think that's why David made the hall. David did not have a heart like God. David had a heart for God. And no matter how much he failed, no matter how often he stumbled, David wanted to keep seeking God. He was a man after God's own heart. He was pursuing God's heart all along. And I think the more we have a heart for God, the more his grace will change our hearts to be like his heart. And what God did for David... I believe one day God is going to do for all creation. I believe it is his grace that sends hope to a broken world. I've got to tell you, this series has been really tough for me in this regard. This series, as I've worked through it, has done absolutely nothing in terms of raising my appreciation or uh, uh, my view of the goodness of man absolutely nothing because even the best of us have pages in our story we wish could get skipped but this series has markedly elevated my view of the grace of God Amen. his goodness is the only hope for our brokenness so at the 20th anniversary of the horrific school shooting at Columbine in Colorado the faith community, the, several of the pastors around that area gathered the community together for a commemoration 
And they asked Christian author Philip Yancey if he would come and be the speaker. And one of the people who came was a well-known artist, a Japanese man named Makoto Fujimura. And he was deeply moved by the tragedy at Columbine. And as a Christian artist, he responded with art and a painting that he dedicated there at that anniversary. Something that he had kept for 20 years uh, for himself, but thought maybe it was appropriate that night to present it to the community. But he also brought something else that night. He brought with him a bowl. And he explained the Japanese practice called kintsugi. And it's more than just a practice, actually. It's, it's more of a philosophy that says you embrace brokenness and you believe that it can be fixed. So they take broken pots or pottery and they keep all of the pieces. You know, something uh, that's a family heirloom, heirloom gets knocked off the shelf, it's broken. Well, you don't just throw it away. You pick up all the shards and the pieces and you, you keep them. And uh, if you uh, uh, keep it long enough and eventually find a master, somebody who could put it all back together, uh, the master will come and he will fuse all of those pieces together with pure gold. Take a closer look at this bowl that he presented. This broken bowl is now more valuable and more precious than it's ever been. That bowl, that bowl was from the 1600s. It was broken in the 1700s. And that family kept those pieces till the 1900s when it could be repaired by a master. And with the family's permission, it was given to the people of Columbine as a symbol of embracing the brokenness because the healing and restoration will come. I believe grace can fix it. Grace is the hope of the world. Sermons like this are hard. I, I know that as I've been speaking, not just today, but throughout this series, some of you have had memories come back about your worst fail in life. Things that make you feel ashamed. Things you wish you could erase from your past, but you can't. Confess it to God and beg for mercy. God's grace is bigger than your worst fail, and God can fix it. And maybe for others of you, as we've gone through this series, something has triggered a memory that of a time when you were failed. Somebody else took advantage of you. And what happened to you was evil, like what happened to Bathsheba. And I'm, I'm sorry for that. And I, I don't know how. It may be in this lifetime. It may not be until the life to come. But grace is going to fix it. I, I love how the Bible treats Bathsheba. She has another son, you know, and the prophet Nathan comes to her and says, now when this boy is born, you give him the name Jedediah because that name means he is loved by God. And then you get into Matthew chapter one and you first thing you come across is the genealogy of Jesus and her name is there, Bathsheba, the great, great, great grandmother of of Jesus exalted in heaven grace is going to fix it God sends grace he sent grace with a name that name is Jesus the Bible is telling us an epic story and it ends with Jesus making everything new again you and I will get the world that God always wanted us to to have God will not fail and until then I think we take encouragement for the very last line in the story that God spoke to us in Scripture Revelation 22 verse 21 the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people amen that is epic I want us to pray about that would you bow with me Oh, God, this morning, we, uh, we recognize our need for grace so desperately. We need grace for the things we've done. And some of us, Lord, may need grace for the things that were done.
to us. Lord, we just need more grace. We, we beg for it. We plead for it. We have no right to it. We, we didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. We're just asking for your undeserved grace. That scandalous, amazing grace. We're asking for Jesus to come and to live in our hearts in a, maybe a more powerful way than he ever has before. Because now our eyes have been opened. And we understand that your grace truly is greater than our most epic fails. And for that, we praise your holy name in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, we typically will end our services here with an invitation. An invitation, if you've never confessed Jesus as Lord, to do that, to submit to a baptism in him. The scripture says when we confess our sins and we are submitted to a, a, a baptism into him, that baptism is, is an act of burying the old person, deleting, having those sins deleted and being raised to walk in a new life with Christ, putting on the righteous robe of Jesus. And so if you've never done that at home, find a, a local church where you can talk to somebody. If you're in our area uh, and are here today and would like to talk to us about that, nothing would give us greater joy than to search the scriptures with you and find out what God says you need to do in order to, to have that confidence that grace has covered all of your fails and it is available to you as well thank you for tuning in and joining us today god bless you we look forward to seeing you next week as well